Yeah, because like uh, if you jump straight away to uh, ultrasound use in assess uh, free responsiveness for or acute free resuscitations, uh, probably might uh, be quite difficult uh, before knowing the basic of uh, echocardiogram. So probably uh, subsequently, maybe you can you can make times uh, so that we can uh, have a few uh, sessions uh, of this uh, this uh, talk, yeah, and uh, mainly to learn some ultrasound, and uh, we we can go through uh, ultrasound uh, basic echo they're going to run through today, and uh, in future a uh, time to come, then we can learn about uh, ultrasound in shock. Because you need to learn echo first before we go into the shop. And then after that, in, 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 we have opportunity again and we can go on ultrasound lung. And uh, also uh, EFAS. And also ultrasound cranium. And also uh, ultrasound in terms of uh, a procedure. right? So we'll be more on the introduction. So once you start to learn the basic uh, introduction, then uh, when there are opportunity, you can always uh, use a machine uh, to, to practice. Yeah, you can see my slide, yeah? Can you see my slide? Mm, can, also can. Okay. Is it a full screen or is it a partial, a partial screen? Or... You see the a full... outline. The outline is on the right side and then there's a full screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, can. It, it's not a full screen. Not a full screen. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, full, it's full full screen on the top. Full screen. Okay. How about now? Now it's full, uh, full screen. Ah, okay. All right. You can stop me anytime uh, whenever that you want to ask questions. So today we're going to uh, go through some basic echo view. Some of you might have known, but then uh, just go and just treat it as a revision. So we're going to go through uh, this is the outline, yeah? some introductions. When you want to do an uh, uh, image or ultrasound, we need to use appropriate probe, getting the right probe. And then also looking at the appropriate window and getting the right view. And also you need to know the uh, sonar anatomy of the heart. And later on, we'll have, give you some pathological example. So knowing the probe is very important, right? So uh, commonly when we call a probe, a cardiac probe is what we call a face array probe. This is a phase array probe. And um, the phase array probe uh, specific thing is that you see the, the surface of the probe is square and flat, right? And they come with two, commonly two frequency, two to four, which is a lower frequency, is for adult because it can penetrate deeper. Five to eight is for neonate or child. And in the markets, uh, they are even better probe now, a probe for a premature baby. Huh? They can go up to from 6 to 10 megahertz huh? for face array probe for a pediatric huh? for, for a premature baby. You also can use microconvex. This is a microconvex probe, right? Like usually we say that it's abdominal probe, right? So we have it in a PICU, and this is a micro. Uh, micro, this is a curvy linear, sorry, curvy linear probe. We have it in the PICU, and this is a micro convex probe. Okay, that uh, neonet uh, unit have it. So the difference is that the frequency a bit different. Uh, micro convex here, the small one, usually a uh, higher frequency. You can see superficial structure very well. So this one is very useful uh, for neonatal uh, unit. You can do ultrasound, cranium, echo, abdominal ultrasound, and even setting. <laughs> set line using this probe. And the other, line, the other probe is curvy linear. There is a dominant probe. They are lower frequency. When you say some probe with low frequency, he can go uh, to penetrate the stru deeper structure much better. So these are two image 
similar image come from two different probes. No? As you could see that uh, this is a phase array probe. This is a curvy linear probe. First thing that you notice that uh, which image produced by which uh, probe is that phase array probe, you see the sharp end here. No? Sharp end come down no? because the sound wave is produced by the center of the probe. Only one single uh, waveform come down. Okay, one single source of the sound come down. As compared to the curvy linear, the curvy linear, that there's a multiple prop, multiple uh, pro, uh, the planet, uh, crystal on the surface. That's why you could see that the area that cover is quite wide. Okay, it's not from one single area; it's a wide area. Huh? Okay, and it cover quite a big area. The other very important feature is that here, if you look at this image. You could see the image moving a bit real time, very move very fast. Okay, as compared to this curvy linear, it's like a slow, slightly slow motion as compared to this. Okay, so this is because of the design of the probe as well. Because if the sound wave comes from one point, then it can receive the sound wave very immediately, right? So that, that's why the, the machine can analyze it and then produce the image directly. As compared to the curvy linear, the image that produced is usually not so dynamic and it's a bit slower okay? because there's multiple probe uh, shining, uh, produce sound and then receive sound at the same time. So that's why the image quality is a bit slower. Okay? But it doesn't mean that uh, curvy linear cannot be used as an echo. And, uh, it just means that the, you will not able to see the dynamic uh, of, the, of the heart uh, movement uh, well. There are a lot of rules uh, some rules that uh, when you do an ultrasound or an echo cardiogram, as compared to a, a common, the usual uh, pointer, you know, uh, the cardiac echo is a bit uh, uh, in the reverse of the usual ultrasound. Most of the ultrasound, they are marker. This is a marker always on your left side or the patient right side. Huh? Okay your left side or the patient right side. Okay? Most of the time the marker will be here, but uh, for echocardiogram, yeah. they, the pointer is pointing towards uh, this side, your right side, patient left side. Mm -hmm. The pointer means here is this, this is a line to suggest a pointer. Mm -hmm. So when you put a probe onto the patient, the pointer will be pointing towards the patient left side, but will be on your right side. Mm -hmm. It will be corresponding to this area. Yeah. So that's about the probes. Huh? After knowing about the probes, then you need to know about the window. So in order to do an echocardiogram, so you'll find that um, our window is actually very small. So what do we understand by the window? Because this is a place that you can look into the heart. So the, the heart is actually surrounded by the lung. Lung is always the enemy of the ultrasound. So whatever that you could see is only this little area. That's why sometimes you see when the Martin do echocardiogram, there's only a certain specific area that we can do. We cannot uh, have uh, to, to, to do it, to do it uh, all over the place, but it's only a specific view. Huh? Right. So remember, the area that you can do the scanning is only in this central part okay, and the base with the bottom part. So these are the area, right? Because yeah, the, the rest of it is covered by the Air, huh? which is you're going to have this image, huh? the lung image, right? Only that certain area, huh? like, like this one, they can, huh? like for this is made image, you produce from here, yeah, then you can get that. And, and especially in ventilator patient, that you find it sometimes very difficult to get a good view. The reason being is that huh? the lung are very hyperinflated. If the lung are very hyperinflated, you're going to cover your window some more, you're going to obscure the window further. So that's why in ventilator patient, sometimes it's quite challenging to get a good view. All right, so talking about the probe and the window, now let's talk about the view. So this is what we call a parasternal uh, long axis view, all right? Why you say the long axis? Why you say a parasternal? Because it's beside the sternum. Long axis because it's follow the axis of the heart. Remember, the axis of the heart is like this, okay? All right, this is the axis of the heart. So when you say that long axis, you follow the axis of the heart, right? Which means the position has to be like that. So this one will be the image you're going to produce. Huh? So this is called a parasternal long axis. Huh? And when you turn the probe 90 degree, 
You want to get palace turner, short assist view. Palace turner, short axis view. This is a short axis. Okay. So this is the image that you're going to study. Remember, palace turner, beside the turner, short axis. The long axis is like this. Short axis is opposite. Huh? Then you've got apical, huh? apical four chamber view, right? So why apical? Because the, the, the probe need to be moved to the apex, okay? Move to the apex and look up into the heart, right? So this is apical four chamber view. Why four chamber? Because you could see one, two, three, four, four chamber. And we, this is another view, what we call subcostal view. Just now we have parasana, apical, now we have a subcostal. We are looking at, uh, at the, uh, at the to the heart at, from the subcostal area. Okay, so this is a subcostal view whereby liver is a very important medium in axis. Uh, the this image because we, we, the liver itself can help as a conductor uh, conduct the sound wave so that you can see the heart much better. Okay, so those are the view. Uh. And you're moving upwards. Okay, so this is a suprasternal aortic arch view. Suprasternally, you're looking at the aortic arch. Remember, this is aortic arch. Okay. So the probe need to be pointing towards around two o'clock position to follow the orientation of the arch. And hence, you're going to get a nice arch and like this kind of pattern, right? So this is a supersonal aortic arch. So after knowing all the view, so this is a few steps, a basic simple step that you can follow uh, for you to do uh, echocardiogram, okay? So you look through the, the process first, then we're going to go to one by one, okay? Just remember the step. Hmm? Okay. Okay, start from the palasternum, the pointer point towards the 10 o'clock, right? This is a long axis, palasternum axis, and turn the probe 90 degree. You swing the probe up, swing the probe down. So it's a short axis view, different short axis view. Then you glide the probe to the apex, okay, until you see the tip of the heart, and then look upward to get the four chamber view. Look further up, you're going to five chamber view. Then slide the probe to the midline, okay. After the midline, tilt the probe a little bit to the left, okay, and then you've got the uh, uh, IVC view, okay. Just remember the probe, the, the, the sequence, huh? palasternum, long axis, short axis. Okay, tilt up and down. Okay, this is a different short axis view. Slide down the probe to the apex of the heart. Okay, and look upwards for chamber view. Look further up, you get a fifth chamber view. Then slide the probe down to the midline subcostally. Tilt the probe slightly to give the, the IVC. Hmm? One more time. Huh? Okay. Slide down palasternum long axis. Right, this long axis. Turn around the probe, 90 degree, look up, okay, and then look down for a different view of the short axis, okay. Then after that, you, you glide down the probe to the apex of the heart, okay, and look upward again, okay, four chamber and five chamber, okay, and then move the probe to the midline, okay, subcostally, tilt the probe slightly, and then you go to the IBC. Huh? So this is a sequence. Huh? We're going to go one by one. Huh? So this is a palasternal long axis. Okay. Um, you first start from the left palasternum, okay, and then you slightly glide down. You slide down the probe. Make sure that the pointer always point towards the 10 o'clock position. Okay. Slide down until you see a nice view like this. Huh? This is what we call a palasternal long axis. Okay. Similarly, here, the pointer point towards 10 o'clock. Huh? Sometimes when you are you are uh, more familiar already, you can straight away put it uh, onto the position. But it would be a good practice, especially if you want to get uh, a parallel type of long axis, you always start from the top. Yeah? Start on the top and then slowly you slide down. But making sure that this pointer is always point towards the end. So this is what we call a palasternal long axis view. Whatever you see here, anteriorly is a right ventricle. Okay? This is a right ventricle, okay, you see, and then this is an interventricular septum, okay, and uh, the, it, uh, this chamber is a, a left ventricle, left ventricle, right, so 
So, and then this is the iota, huh? the aortic valve. Okay. This is the mitral valve. Okay. Mitral valve. This is the left atrium. Okay. The one that hanging the valve is a papillary muscle. Huh? So, these are two papillary muscle. This is a posterior wall. Okay. Posterior wall of the left ventricle. Right. Okay. And down there, actually, is the, huh? it's the lung. Okay. And then iota is the tank. Right. So it's corresponding to this image, huh? RVOT, right? Uh, ventricular outflow tract. One, okay. Ventricular septum, left ventricle, left atrium, okay. Iotic valve, mitral valve, okay. Then the papillary muscle. So after getting the long axis view, you turn the probe 90 degree. Huh? Turn the probe 90 degree. No need to move. No need to adjust the position, just turn it uh, 90 degree. After turning 90 degree, this is a short axis view that you're going to get, right? So this is a aortic uh, short axis. Huh? So you start from the middle, you're going to see the Mercedes sign, but um, it's sometimes very difficult to see the Mercedes, but it's rather a Y. Huh? You see the, the buff leaflet one, two, and then sometimes you can see another one. It's still like a Y rather than a Mercedes. Huh? So in the central is actually an iota, okay, aortic valve, okay, and this valve is actually a tricuspid valve, and this valve is a pulmonary valve. So after knowing these three valves, this side is a right ventricle, okay, this is a main pulmonary artery. You divide to the right and the left pulmonary artery, and this is supposed to be your atrium. Huh? This is the right atrium. And I can see that the atrial septum is here, okay, and then left atrium, right? Okay, remember, so from the long axis slide down, then you turn 90 degree, okay? So this is a, 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 the, the short axis view. Huh? So sometimes you might not get this view, okay? Uh, sometimes you might get other view. Huh? So this is the other view that you might, you might be observing, huh? okay? So this is other view. Huh? So sometimes you might get this view, sometimes you might get this view, sometimes you might get this view. Right, different view. Huh? It depending on where is the position. Huh? But most of the time, if you after getting a long axis, you turn out ninety degree. Huh? So you're going to get this aortic aortic view of the short axis. Okay. So after you get the aortic view of short axis, okay, you tilt the probe slightly posteriorly like this now. Huh? Tilt the probe slightly posteriorly. Then you're going to see a fish mouth. Huh? This is a mitral valve view. Huh? Uh, but it is a short uh, mitral valve view. Okay, where you, can, you could see the center is the fish mouth. Huh? You tilt a bit more, right? Posteriorly, then you get the papillary muscle view. Okay, and you tilt further, and then you get the apical view. Right. So what's the importance of this view? Uh, this this view is very important, especially this one. Okay, when you see the papillary muscle view, it's actually at the mid uh, ventricle, huh? the center of the ventricle. Okay. It's very important to recognize that this uh, papillary muscle view uh, is supposed to be a donut shape, uh, round donut. Okay, if you the left side ventricle round donut shape, I mean there's no compression pressure from the right heart. So if you have right heart pressure is high, okay, then this donut shape will become a D shape, okay, because this area will going to be flattened by the high pressure on the right heart. Right? So that is a short axis. Okay. So after getting the short axis, let's move to the apex. Okay. So from there on, you just migrate your probe. Huh? Slowly follow through, migrate your probe until you see you look at the apex of the heart. Huh? So this is the apex of the heart. You slowly migrate until you could see that this apex of the heart. After seeing this apex of the heart, and then you slightly tilt upwards. Okay? You tilt upwards. This is the view that you're going to get. So this is what we call apical four chamber view. Huh? Why four chamber? One, two, three, four. So you get left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, right atrium. Center is the ventricular septum. This is the atrial septum. This is a mitral valve, tricuspid valve. All right. So this is the apical four chamber view. In this view, you can see, um, observe both uh, left and right ventricle, uh, see how they interact with each other. Also, the atrial septum, uh, see any uh, deviation. Okay. After that, you tilt outwards slightly. Uh, from the, from the four chamber view, you tilt the probe slightly outwards. Okay. Then you're going to see that another chamber come up from here. 
So this is another chamber coming up from here. So this is a fifth chamber, right? So one, two, three, four, five, the fifth chamber. The fifth chamber, what does the fifth chamber mean? Is that it's the aortic, huh? it's the aortic roots, okay, and, and the aorta, huh? So it's the aortic root and aorta. The important of this is that later on, uh, we we have time, then we go for a bit more advanced uh, uh, cardiac monitoring, and you can actually measure the uh, cardiac output uh, from, from this chamber. Right? The, the cardiac output can be calculated, right? So this is a five chamber, the fifth chamber view. So after the fifth chamber view, we always like to go to the IVC, right? So how to get the IVC? A lot of time is that our mistake is always put our probe in the middle and then try to look at the monitor. But most of the time you cannot get it no? or find it difficult to get it. The trick is that you don't look at the, the ultrasound uh, uh, monitor, just look at the patient, right? Move your probe to the midline, okay? Move the probe to the, the midline of the patient, okay? Subcostally, tilt the probe slightly. And then usually you could see this image, right? So this image is actually the liver. So it's the liver. This is the IVC, okay? And then this is the portal vein. Huh? Portal vein, this is a part of the hepatic vein. Okay, all right. So it, yeah, so as you can see that the hepatic vein is here, portal vein is here, the IVC, right? Okay. Always put it in the midline first, then tilt the probe. Then only you start to look onto the, uh, the screen of the ultrasound and then try to look for this. So what's the important of inferior vena cava? As we could see that as you know that um, when we the, the, the size of the IVC will change, will vary according to respiration. Let's talk about spontaneous respiration first. Huh? With spontaneous respiration during inspiration, our intrathoracic pressure will reduce. Okay? When the intrathoracic pressure is reduced, it creates a sucking mechanism. It sucks in the blood in the IVC. So when the sucking effort comes in, into the IVC, the IVC will collapse. Right? On the other hand, when, when you exhale, okay, when you exhale, when you have a during exhalation, especially in forced exhalation, the intrathoracic pressure will increase. This high intrathoracic pressure will prevent the blood in the IVC to go into the heart. So that makes the IVC size increase, right? So I mean during inspiration, physiologically, right, the IVC will collapse. And when ex exhalation in physiology, IVC will distend. Okay? But in a situation, normal situations, okay, whereby uh, in a normal individual, this variation can be up to 50%. Right? I mean, the variation in terms of the size of the IVC, be it the diameter or the radius, right, can be changed up to around 50%. But any variations of more than 50% of the IVC size in a spontaneous breathing patient, uh, suggestive of this patient, are either having uh, upper airway obstruction, okay, because you know that the variation is due to the changes of the intrathoracic pressure. If you have a patient who has severe asthma or severe respiratory distress, okay, so there will be very, a lot of variation in terms of intrathoracic pressure. The variation of the intrathoracic pressure will cause significant variation in the IVC. Sometimes it can be more than uh, 50%. This is what we call uh, collapsibility index. Right? Collapsibility index is uh, especially during spontaneous respiration whereby the IVC collapse more than 50%, okay? Then uh, it is significant. On the other hand, beside upper airway obstruction that leading to increased intrathoracic uh, uh, pressure differences. Uh, other important thing is that uh, in a patient who has severe dehydration, huh? so in the situation of severe dehydration or patient who have potential fluid responsiveness or there's a, uh, you could ever to fluid, um, the, if the patient are hypotensive, they could accept fluid, okay? So the Intravascular volume deficiency, right, can cause this kind of variation as well because it is just too lacking. Huh? The, the free volume in the in the venous system is just too lacking. When there's a small variation in terms of the uh, intrathoracic pressure, will cause significant variation in the IVC, right? 
So that is in a patient with spontaneous respiration. So if you do the IVC, looking at the IVC by ultrasound, if the variation is significantly more than 50%, yeah. So it, it tells you two things. Okay? One thing is that the intrathoracic pressure uh, might be significant difference, okay? Right? Be it too negative or too positive, or patient might be severely dehydrated, right? On the other hand, in a patient with ventilated, as you know that um, in the patient with ventilated, you know, both inspiration and expiration both are positive pressure. That means we give, a, let's say, the patient ventilator of PIP of 12 or PEP of 5, 12 over 5. So these pressure are all positive pressure, okay? 12, 5, okay? As compared to the spontaneous inspiration, right? During the spontaneous inspiration, sometimes our normal intrathoracic pressure during the uh, spontaneous inspiration uh, can be minus 5 to minus 8, okay? That is uh, the trans, trans, uh, transpulmonary pressure, huh? So minus five, minus eight. So it, it, it turned around in a patient that uh, ventilated, the intrathoracic pressure, the, the pressure in the, that we contribute to the lung is always positive, 12, five, if you using positive pressure ventilation. So with, with this variation, so when you have lower pressure uh, in the intrathoracic area, so the IVC will not be standard that much. So, and if you have higher pressure, so the IVC will be distended because the blood just couldn't go through the heart because the intrathoracic is, pressure is high. So that's why the terminology here change. Instead of collapsibility, now ventilator patient, they become a distensibility, right? So the IVC distended during inspiration, right? So this distensibility, uh, people are always measuring uh, how much percentage is considered uh, significant. In a, in a patient who are normal volumia, so usually they have a variation of the distensibility index of less than 20%, right? So they mean the size change should not be more than 20%. If the size change of a ventilator patient is more than 20%, uh, it tell you similarly two things. Yeah, there's a significant intrathoracic pressure variation or the patient uh, intravascularly still depleted. So that is an important uh, concept that is one when you look at the IVC that you have, huh? right? So this is a situation in the patients who are pre-responsiveness, whereby there is potentially uh, patient can take in some free, right? So there is significant variation, right? In terms of the size, okay? What if the patient has already well filled, okay? Really well resuscitated, free already too much, so there will be no changes in terms of the uh, variation during inspiration expression. So this is the standard thing. Okay. So when you look at it carefully, it's, this IVC is basically it's like a whale. Huh? It's like a whale. So this is the liver, huh? which is the head of the whale, the water vein and the IV, the hepatic vein as a nose of the whale, and then the eye is water vein. Okay, so this is IVC. Okay. So there are two conditions, okay. So sometimes in terms of measurement, it might be a challenging, okay? But if you look at the variation itself, sometimes it's already good enough to tell you that, yeah, okay, this patient has enough free early. For example, if you look at this whale, it's always smiling and then laughing away, okay? So, and happily open up the mouth, okay? So this is a happy whale, whereby it signifies patient is adequately filled. On the other hand, if you look at this IVC, it's like a... It's like a little whale is constantly eating and drinking, right? So this is a thirsty whale, huh? whereby the child, if you if the patient is hypotensive or you think that the, the circulation is not adequate, huh? so this this whale tell you that uh, this patient still will still benefit with suffering. Okay. Sometimes people like to measure, okay. So if you measure, so we put the patient on the on the M modes, okay, looking at the do an M mode cross along this uh, uh, this area. Sometimes people we always like to say maybe about two or three centimeters behind the hepatic vein insertion. So you're going to see the variation of the size of the diameter uh, of the diameter during the uh, both inspiration and expiration. Uh, so then after you calculate 
the variation here. So from eyeballing itself, you know that this patient have a significant collapsibility index. Okay. And for example, for this one, right? so you couldn't see much variation. Huh? So this is a very happy whale. Okay. IBC very grossly the standard. Okay. When you put the M across, you didn't see much variation in this IBC. Okay. Right. So sometimes to in order to get a longitudinal view, sometimes it's not easy, especially when the patient um, or the connect a bit obese huh? or patient big size patient, sometimes very difficult to get a nice view of the longitudinal view of the IVC. And in order to get uh, to, to avoid uh, sometimes when we cut it, uh, when you do the ultrasound sometimes we might not get the at the midline of the IVC. So we can do a transverse. Huh? So meaning that you put the probe 90 degree of what you did just now. Huh? Just now you get the nice whale view of the IVC, right? But if you cannot see the whales, okay, sometimes you cut across. You, you cannot sometimes if you cannot see the mouth of the whale, okay, you can't find it, or you cannot get a good view. What you need to do is you just turn the probe 90 degree like this, okay? Turn the probe 90 degree, then you could see this view. Huh? This view means you cut transversely. Huh? And then when you look at it, the anatomical structure here, anteriorly, this is the liver, and then this is the IVC, this is the iota. Okay? Right? So it's important that we know that uh, the, the, the relationship between the IVC and the iota. Right? So if the IVC is, uh, in a normal situation, the IVC should be supposed to be the same size or one and a half time. Hmm? of the iota. So that's why the IVC aortic ratio is 1 to 1.5. So if you notice that the IVC diameter is less than iota, anything less than 1 or 0 0.8, meaning that the patient is volume de depleted. Or if the IVC over aortic ratio is more than 1.5, which means the IVC is very big as compared to the iota, that means the patient is already adequately filled, right? Okay. So as you could see at this structure, so this is iota, right? So this is the IVC. And you can clearly demonstrate that the IVC is very, very well filled. Huh? This is about nearly about more than 1.5 of the aortic size. Okay. Moving on, so sometimes anteriorly you cannot see the heart because the the, the lung is just too hyperinflated. So we can do a subcostal view. How to do a subcostal view is just now from moving from the transverse view. Okay, we just tilt the probe slightly, like what you see here. Okay, as compared to just now, you just do a transverse. Now you tilt the probe slightly and looking towards the left shoulder. Okay, so this is what you're going to see. Importantly, you use a lever to, to as a medium to see through the to see into the heart. So this is a subcostal. Um, atrial view, whereby the first image that you're going to see here is his atrium. Huh? So this is a right atrium, left atrium, atrial septum. This is a mitral valve. This is a, uh, this is a tricuspid valve. This is a mitral valve. Okay. Mm -hmm. You tilt again slightly outwards, then you're going to see part of the uh, ventricle. Okay. You outward again, then you're going to see the five chamber view. Huh? So both ventricle and also the aortic outflow. So this is how you're going to get the view okay, uh, in, in, in a patient with hyperinflated. Huh? Moving on, you need to see the iota. Yeah? So you just move the probe outwards suprasternally okay, above the suprasternal notch, okay, making sure that the pointer is pointing towards two o'clock position and look down into the heart. Right? Then you're going to see this aortic arch. This, this view is important for you to determine whether there is any uh, coordination or iota. So that's just how it was all about the image of the heart, right? And um, commonly, we always like to use color Doppler to look at the flow and look for any shunt. Okay? Now let's go through the color Doppler. Now. How to get the color Doppler? So there's a color button, depending on whatever machine, but they always commonly, they name the color button as color, okay? Importantly is that um, the color does not tell you whether this is artery or the vein. 
the color actually tell you the direction of the of the flow uh, in corresponding to the probe, right? It's a mnemonic called but okay, blue away, red towards the probe. Uh, it is corresponding towards the probe. Blue, the setting color blue is always set away from the probe, right? The blood move away from the probe. Right. So for example, here, huh? so this is uh in, this is a view of a uh, carotid artery and then the internal jugular vein, right? So if the probe is the, the is the surface of the probe looking towards the, the cowder, towards the leg of the child, okay. So you're gonna see the iota huh? is giving you a red color because the blood flow towards the probe, okay, and then the vein, the blood flow away from the probe. But if you flip the probe and to another the other position, which means the surface of the probe, you face it or you point it towards the head, right? So this is going to give you a different image now, okay? Because the, the artery flow is actually flowing towards the head, right? So that's why it's away from the probe. That's why it become a blue color. Similarly, the red color here, the vein, because the blood flow actually going towards your prop now. Okay. I hope this will be clear. So remember, the color of the, of the Doppler does not tell you whether it's artery or vein, but what it simply means is that the orientation or the flow of the props in relationship, the, the flow of the blood in relationship to the prop. Okay, so now let's look at the common common uh, Doppler. All right, so this is a four chamber mitral valve, okay, tricuspid valve, ventricular septum, atrial septum. So the blood flow actually from the atrium towards the ventricle. So this is the direction. That's why you can see the red color flow upward here. Huh? And you could see the tiny blue here. The tiny blue here is actually from the pul pulmonary vein. Huh? The pulmonary vein flow down and then go up, okay? Down, down means away from the probe, okay? Which is corresponding to here. When the color is more blue, then it's away. It's a color more yellow, it's go towards, okay? So the, the, the blood flow down and then go up. You could notice that there's a blue color here. The blue color here signify the blood flow from the left ventricle into the aortic, into the aorta. Huh? So like you could see here, just have to continue that one. So you flow down the blood flow away down to the iota. This is the right atrium, right ventricle. The blood flow from the right atrium flow into the right ventricle. Yeah. So uh, this is a five chamber view. The blood flow down into the iota. That's why it's blue color down to the iota. So you see that there's an abnormal pattern of the flow Beside on all this, it will tell you that whether there is a lot of turbulent flow. Huh? So long axis, the blood flow from left atrium to the left ventricle and then flow up to the iota. Huh? So that's what you could see here. The blue, the red color flow away from the left atrium to the left ventricle and then flow downwards to the iota. Right? And then this is a iota, huh? go to the aortic valve, and flow down. So this is a short axis view. So this is a view that we always want to see whether it got PDA or not. Huh? Okay. So here the flow from the right ventricle flow down, huh? flow down into the uh, main pulmonary artery. Huh? You could see that there's some turbulent flow across. Huh? The color uh, is a bit, it is a big background of blue, but with some redness huh? because the, there's a turbulent inside. Huh? So it tell you there's some turbulent. Yeah. So this is aortic arch, okay. This aortic arch, the blood flow is from here go down, huh? From here go down. That's why if you go down away from the probe, it's actually a blue color. Hmm? So now after knowing that a basic heart of a core, then you go through a few common scenario situation. Huh? So now, um, yeah, looking at this film, okay. Anyone want to guess what? Uh, what is the image uh, show you. Anyone want to try? 
That's so why you wrote that very cardiac effusion. Oh yeah, lah. Oh, tell you the answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I should not tell you. <laughs> okay, never mind. But you you look at it carefully. Huh? Okay. So this is a clear pericardial effusion. Okay. And then this pericardial effusion is actually there's some fibrin inside. Okay. So this is an empyema. Huh? There's some empyema around the heart. Okay. Like pericardial empyema. So this is just a clear pericardial free. Very important to, to see whether the, the pericardial effusion is it significantly causing problem is that we always look at the atrial size. Okay. So if the, if the atrial is always collapsed, okay, you know that uh, most, uh, uh, the atrial pressure most of the time your CBP pressure, which is five to eight uh, millimeter mercury. So if the if the precardiac effusion pressure is much higher than five to eight, you're going to compress the atrium, right? So when the pressure, when the atrium being compressed, meaning that the, the precardiac pressure is more than five to eight, that, that tell you that it's quite significant. So that kind of precardiac effusion need to be drained. So this is another view. So it just show you that you see that the ventricular wall is very thick. Huh? It's a very thick ventricular wall. Okay. So it's a hypertrophic myocardium. And then when you look at the contractility, when you see the contractility, is actually how closely the ventricular wall come to each other. Huh? So this is hardly come to each other, right? So this is a hypertrophic heart with poor contractility. And at the same time, you notice that there is some fluid around the heart, it's a pretty cardiac infusion. And um, no, don't, don't be too worried about how we're going to measure the cardiac contractility, but more importantly is that looking at how the heart contract, right? Or we call it an eyeballing type of con, um, assessment. Huh? Sometimes the eyeballing assessment will be much better. As you could see that this, this uh, heart, huh? both of them, this is a ventricular wall. Huh? The ventricular wall nearly come together quite nicely. It show you that relatively good contractility. Whereas as compared to here, you could see that the well, all the chamber are dilated, okay, and then you could see that the the the, the muscle wall of the heart is quite thin up, yeah? and uh, the heart just hardly contract. Huh? So this is a poor contractility. This is a fairly good contractility. Huh? Similarly, long axis, okay. When you look at the long axis, this ventricular wall nearly come together. Huh? And we will say that the ejection fraction is usually like, meaning that uh, how much of volume change huh, over the left heart. Okay, that's why the ejection fraction, the fraction of the blood that ejected out. Huh? So you could see that the left ventricular volume actually like a significant change in size, either the systolic and the diastolic. Huh? Whereas here, you could see that the left ventricle is very, very dilated and hardly changed in terms of left ventricular volume. So that's why this is a poor cardiac output stage. Huh? Sometimes you can see there's some abnormal rhythm. This is a cardiac arrhythmia. Sometimes you can see from the echocardiogram, not, not looking at the ECG pattern, but sometimes from here, you can know that so there is some abnormal type of contraction. This is another extreme. Just now you say that, oh, the heart, uh, my heart my, uh, contractivity is too good, super good, you see? This quantity is actually super good uh, until you see both ventricles kissing each other and they kiss each other actually significant variation of the volume. Uh. So this pattern basically show you that uh, it's actually an under volume left ventricle. Uh. This patient have very limited volume of the left heart because of the limitation of volume. Yeah, the heart actually, when it, every time that they pump, they actually ejected out most of the blood here. Yeah. And you could Observe a bit more closer, right? The right heart actually slightly dilated, okay? As compared to the left heart. And you look at the lung, okay? the lung is really consolidated. Huh? So this, this, this is a uh, patient with severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, whereby it's due to the lung. The lung are diseased, okay? The pulmonary pressure is too high because the disease of the lung increased the right heart uh, pressure. That's why you got the right ventricular hypertrophy. When you have significant pulmonary hypertension, then you impact your venous return to the left heart. 
So that's why your left part is actually under volume. This is another, just how you when you see the echocardiogram, both the chamber is really uh, nearly uh, equal in size. Huh? So this is apical four chamber. The, the thing most striking here is that you could see that the right heart is much bigger than the left heart, right? And also, you look at the ventricular septum, okay? The ventricular septum here is slightly deviated to the left, okay? Similarly, the atrial septum is remarkably deviated to the left, huh? suggesting like a significant high volume and high pressure over the right heart, okay? So this is an example of the uh, pulmonary hypertension. Huh? Okay. If you put on the Doppler flow, remember just now, the blood flow from the right atrium to the right ventricle is supposed to be red color because it's flowing upwards. But here you could see that there is a reverse flow, whereby you could see that the blue color flow is here now. Okay. It's a blue color flow. Huh? The blue color flow. Uh, this is a blue color flow. This is a red color flow. Huh? Red color flow flow up. And then subsequently, you've got a blue color flow. Huh? So this blue color flow is abnormal. So this blue color flow is actually abnormal. Huh? So it's a regurgitation. When the pressure, why regurgitation happen? Because uh, there is a significant high pressure over the right heart. So the blood flow actually flow reversely into the atrium. Huh? Other condition like in a situation whereby you've got significant heart failure. When the heart failure, the annular or the valve huh, are all enlarged. Huh? And this is an example of a severe mitral valve uh, regurgitation whereby the significant leak, right? You could see that similarly in this pattern. Huh? So instead of the red color flow up, there is uh, some jet flow down. Huh? The jet flow signifies signify, uh, regurgitation. So this is a regurgitation. Lastly, when you look at this, huh? uh, you look at the valve, okay? This is a mitral valve. This is a valve. Huh? So this is actually a vegetation in the tricuspid bar. Okay, I think uh, that is all from me. All right, so uh, this is a, a basic echo first. All right, so when we have chance, then we go for another round. We can go for the um, uh, echocardiogram in assessment of shock. And, and in that, we can actually learn more about uh, how to use it in a different scenario for, for trauma and non-trauma situation. Okay, uh, any question?